I was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to death. There was a lot of pressure on the criminal justice system, on the district attorney office, on the police department to solve this crime because the individual whose son was murdered was a very rich person in the city that um, put fear in our politicians. Um, the night of the crime, a description went out that the perpetrator was six feet tall, medium built, African American. January the 17th, 1985, to wake up that morning and watch the news to see that a person that I know had been arrested, Kevin Freeman. The next thing I know, they're kicking in our door with the guns blaring out and pointing, and scaring the hell out of everybody. And they handcuffed me, told me I was arrested. For, and they didn't tell me why I was arrested. They said I was being brought down to homicide for questioning. For eight to nine hours, I just was interrogated. And a black cop come in, they try to tell me about why I'm being so stupid. They know I don't fit the description. They know who did it, why I'm not telling them the truth. And he decided to play a, a, um, a cassette tape for me. And the cassette tape that he played for me was Kevin Freeman saying that me and him was together. I committed the crime and he took off and run. When my picture appeared in the newspaper that next morning, people went to calling in and saying that I'm the one that robbed them. They told me, we got something for you. They brought me down and rebooked me on all eight counts of them on robberies, um, which one of them led to these three little kids that was robbed by the Superdome. With that, they brought me to trial and, and, and set the murder case back and decided to prosecute me for that robbery case first. Harry Connick was the district attorney in New Orleans for about 30 years from the 70s right through until 2002. That was quite a common practice in that office at the time, to charge somebody facing capital charges with another unrelated crime because it enabled them to get a conviction on a lesser offence first and enabled that office to paint the person who was standing trial for their life as a very dangerous person. At each stage of our process, the post-conviction process that started in 1989, we lost. And we met with him at the prison to tell him that we had failed, that all our work and appeals had failed, and he was going to be executed in 30 days. We became desperate. Someone in Louisiana referred us to a private investigator. Uh, one of the criminal defense lawyers down there suggested a woman, Elisa Abalafia. We had never worked with her. So we asked Elisa, go look. This wasn't saying, go find a needle in a haystack. This was saying, there are a bunch of haystacks and maybe there's a needle in there. We don't know. I focused on the carjacking case because that was the aggravating factor that the DA's office wanted to then use in the murder trial to get the death penalty. The college-age driver, he began struggling and kicking and fighting with the perpetrator. And in the process of kicking, while he's in the passenger seat, he draws blood from the perpetrator that wound up all over his pants. I looked at the police report, and just as they're describing that we confiscated the bloody pants, the next four pages are missing. So why would bloody pants disappear? Answer, you don't want anyone to blood test them and know what they are. We make the discovery that the bloody pants are B and he's O. And by the way, the car driver's O. So we don't have John Thompson in that car. I'm not sure if I used like a black Sharpie or something big, but I remember grabbing a, you know, a regular piece of paper and in big letters, JT is blood type O, he's innocent. Or words to that effect, you know, exclamation mark. When I called home and he told me that was the first thing my lawyers in them see, what's your blood type? We got it. It got crazier though. It didn't get any easier. It got worse to me. Judge Quinlan ruled that we would be entitled to a hearing in the murder case with time to investigate and gather new evidence. We hired a different private investigator. Our different investigator found compelling new evidence, including uh, police reports that had not been disclosed to the defense, 
that had interviews and factual information with witnesses who testified against John, and most importantly, the identities of witnesses who lived near the crime scene, who saw and heard the fleeing murderer, who were interviewed by the police, but who were never identified to the defense. And those witnesses gave accounts to us and in open court that helped establish conclusively that Thompson was not the murderer. The murderer was Kevin Freeman, who was originally charged with Thompson back in 1985. Freeman acted alone in murdering Ray Liuza and pinned it on Thompson. John Thompson was released today after spending nearly all of that time on death row. A jury convicted him in the murder of 32 years To know that a prosecutor could, could actually reach over the barriers of, 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 of his call to duty. His call to duty is to seek the truth. You know, you know when I was arrested, it been all these years later, but it's kind of crazy that the main prosecutor who was overseeing and who prosecuted both of these cases also prosecuted eight of us and put eight, all eight of us on debt row. All of us is African Americans. All of us was accused of killing white Americans. All of us is off debt row.